any objection to being recorded, I'm afraid you'll have to leave the room now. All right, so to introduce Neil, a man who really needs no introduction, but Neil is the IH World Academic Coordinator for Resources and DOS Support. He's a full-time teacher trainer and is currently working uh, with our Delta trainees at IH Buenos Aires Teacher Training. He's a tutor of various IH World courses on OTI and of course gives regular presentations for us, for IH for Macmillan. Uh, he used to work in IH Prague where he began his teaching career and when he's, when he's not doing that he's usually watching football, playing with his cats, um, all manner of things about um, he's a very busy man. So over to Neil. So okay, thank you. thank you very much, Lisa. Yep, time for me to take the stage and hopefully this session is going to inspire all of you to then also take the stage. That's the idea of today's session. We're talking about workshops. It's a, a workshop about workshops, how to do workshops. So we've got some different ideas we're going to be looking at. Today, we're going to start off with stage fright, which is looking at the reasons why people don't necessarily take the stage. I'm sure uh, lots of you in your schools have great actors, and by actors I would mean great teachers. This is um, our stage metaphor. That would be great people to give workshops, have great ideas, uh, lots of interesting things happening in their classrooms, but don't like getting up on the stage, don't want to stand up in front of everybody else at the school. Oh, Santander said they can't hear me. Can everybody else hear me? <clears throat> Hopefully I've started now. Um, yeah, Alexandra can hear me. I think it must be you, I ate Santander. Uh, so we're going to start with that, look at the reasons keeping us back, and hopefully we'll, during the workshop we're going to be getting rid of all that stage fright. Uh, then we're going to look at hitting the boards. How can we start off our workshop? Where does, it, where does our workshop begin from? And where can we take it from there on so that we've got a full workshop ready to put it into action? And that's the next stage of the workshop, lights, camera, action. Actually um, planning the workshop and executing it in the best possible way. Uh, another thing we're going to look at is bridging the gap. And by that I mean bridging the gap between the speaker and the audience. Um, sometimes we're, we're a little bit nervous, maybe sometimes in different environments, like the online environment here, because you can't actually see the audience, although all we get is your names in the participant box. Or maybe you would do a workshop in your school with your peers, but you don't want to do it with a group of 100 strangers at a local conference, or vice versa. You don't mind doing it with strangers, but you don't want to do it with the people you share a staff room with every day. So we'll look at some ways of bridging the gap. And then we'll finish off by hopefully inspiring all of you to take the stage yourselves. Okay, so that's how we're looking today. I'd like to <clears throat> start straight away just by getting an idea of uh, the experience we have in the audience. I'm going to give you a little poll. Here it is. Hopefully you can all see it there. It says, how many workshops have you presented up to now? So I'd like to see, are you... Uh, new people, have you done one or two but you're looking for some new ideas to um, build on those? You've done quite a lot and you're here to share your ideas with less experienced people or like me, you've been doing them for like 15 years and you've got too many to remember. So if you could just choose one of these options that are appearing on the screen <coughs> and we'll see how experienced we are. Look, like we've got a oh, quite an experienced audience out there. I'll give you a few more seconds for a few more people to click on things, balancing it up. Um, oh, we've got quite a lot of people there saying none and the first is a long way off. Well, hopefully today's workshop is going to help you to bring that day closer and closer. But even if it doesn't, hopefully you'll also get lots of, lots of ideas about planning your lessons. Because one of the things we'll look at is how close workshops are to lessons. So, we've got a good broad range there. So I hope the people who've done quite a lot or a few there will... Um, Bring in your ideas, help the rest of us, and add to what I'm saying. Do chip in in the chat box, and we'll take it on there. So let's move on to our first section of the workshop. Um, and I'm going to be throwing you lots of posters. You see, these posters are from businessballs.com. I'll give you the link at the end of the workshop. Um, we'll start off with failure is the mother of success which is uh, because I think a lot of people have stage fright basically because we're afraid of failing, whatever that means when 
it comes to doing a workshop. So what I'd like you to do <clears throat> is to consider what holds us back. And here we have, you might recognize some of these people. This is the audience of a workshop. Uh, this comes from this year's DOS conference. Anybody familiar in the photograph there for you? Uh, and I would like to pick out Al there, right? Yeah, Robin's seen him right in the center there. You can see he's he's looking so excited, he's enthused, he's inspired. He'd love to get up on the stage, but something's holding him back. And so the question is, what's holding Al back? What's holding you back? Etc. These are the questions. So I've got another poll for you, and I'd like you to th um, just to type in the poll any ideas you have, not just what's holding you back, what holds people back, what stops us from doing a workshop, what gives us stage fright. Um, just click your answers in the box at the top there, and then we will all share them. So someone's already put fear, you're afraid. But what are your fear of being boring? We don't want everyone to fall asleep while we're giving our workshops. Type, 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 and then we'll have a little look at them together. Okay, great. Loads of ideas there, so we've got to keep this section short. Um, I want to make sure we get through everything because there you go. Lack of time is the last one. Um, lack of time, I presume, is lack of time to plan the workshop. And so, yeah, <coughs> it does take some time to plan a workshop. I'm not going to pretend it doesn't, even after years and years. This one has took me a whole day to plan and put together. Uh, so it does take time, but hopefully you'll find as we go through today's workshop that it is worth putting that time in. You're helping other people and you're developing yourself, as you'll see from some more of the posters. If you're too shy and you're lacking confidence, uh, and there's quite a few here saying lacking confidence, etc., then the only way to get over that really is by doing it. And you can see other people talk to other people who've done it. Uh, it is one way of getting over your shyness. Uh, I could certainly sympathize with what you're saying here. I actually think I went into teaching because I was very, very shy. And so I became a teacher because it forced me to get up in front of a class of 30 people. Uh, but if you can do that every day in the classroom, I would argue that it's exactly the same doing it in a workshop. Um, however shy you are, then uh, you're doing it every day anyway. So you can do it. Um, Beverly has suggested leading a workshop with somebody else helps. It certainly does. It will give you that moral support, the two of you together. That should help you overcome your lack of confidence. So as we move through these, it's online. It's being recorded. Your failure is there for all to see, but your, su your success is there for all to see. I think you'll see we're all our own worst critics, and we think we might have failed, but everybody else thinks it was a really good workshop. We come out. I came out of... The, the Wednesday version of the shop thinking, oh, I went over time, I forgot to say this, I didn't say that, I said too much at the beginning. Uh, but then I got lots of emails saying, oh, thanks, that was really helpful, got some nice ideas, etc. Your perception and the audience perceptions can be very different. And of course, again, this uh, is very similar to being in the classroom. You come out of class going, oh, that didn't work very well, but the students go home thinking, oh, great, I learned loads today. Uh, so. Don't worry about that. Don't worry about being online either. You can always do the, do the workshop face-to-face. -face. Ask us not to share the recording if, if it uh, doesn't go well. But workshops tend to go well for the audience, even if you think they don't go well. A lack of confidence in your ability, then simply you need to ask people, is this a good idea? Talk to your DOS. Hopefully your DOS is going around encouraging you to be giving workshops. If people are asking you to do a workshop, they have the confidence in your ability. Uh, the background of the people of the audience is definitely a very interesting one because you might think that the people and the attendees are more experienced, which comes there uh, three or four times in the answers. Well, the answer to this question is basically that a workshop isn't about telling people who don't know things uh, all the time. And we're going to look at that in much more detail as we work through the workshop. But I think the most important message that we can take away from today's workshop, uh, so I'm going to say it now and say it again and again and again, is that people come to a workshop, they're hoping to get a workshop, uh, they'd like to take away at least one new idea, maybe be reminded of something else, and enjoy sharing with other people, maybe give 
have the opportunity to share one of their ideas. So I think they're the three things people are looking for from a workshop. And you can do that with more experienced people. And so as we head into the next section, we're going to be looking. You only need like one new idea, one different idea, one successful idea. And I think what people are saying there in the chat box is very true. You all have the ideas to share uh, with each other. It's about sharing. It's not about you telling everybody. So we can meet through those. Um, not meeting expectations very much comes into the planning and the preparing. Make sure that you're selling your workshop, writing the abstract. It's what you're going to do. If you're feeling much more you're going to be sharing ideas than giving new ideas, say that in your abstract so the people are coming know that they're doing. Uh, this is an interesting one, the feeling that others could do it better, so why bother? <clears throat> um, why bother? Because it's an excellent way for you to develop. And we'll see that later on as well. So by doing a workshop, you're learning about the topic much, much more than you would otherwise. And you don't want the same people at your school always doing the same thing. So, And who says they can do it better? Uh, you can try and do it better than they can. Technical difficulties can always happen, particularly with online workshops. Um, but remember, they can happen with our face-to-face -face workshops too. <clears throat> and Kylie, now I'm sure <laughs> Kylie's mentioned Jeremy Harmer. He'll come up later as well. But I'm sure lots of you can actually do much better workshops than Jeremy. But we'll save that point for later. We talked about the attendees being technical difficulties can happen. Technical difficulties can happen in your classes. So what's the uh, answer to technical difficulties? Same answer. Yep. Joanna said the same. Glad you agree, Joanna. Yeah, always have a backup plan. Plan B, etc. The plan B today is Lisa, if my internet fails. Hope she knows that. Um, so I think we're there now. Fear of not being understood is an interesting one. You teach every day. You have your techniques, procedures. And so you should be able to use those in a workshop. And we're going to come back again and again to the idea that giving a workshop is very much like giving a lesson. Laziness is something I'm afraid I'm not going to be able to help you with, apart from hopefully thinking, oh, that sounds like fun, giving a workshop. Maybe I shouldn't be so lazy. And I don't, the audience don't know everything. If it, nobody knows everything. Uh, even if there's nothing new in ELT, people are saying the same things again. Saying them again reminds people of things. Every time I go to a workshop, I come across an idea and I think, oh, yeah, I haven't done that for ages. Great. And that's what I'm looking for out of a workshop. So hopefully this little discussion, which I have speeded through, <clears throat> is going to help you to not hold back. And we'll be coming back to many of these themes through the rest of the workshop. Interesting question by Kylie there for you to answer in the chat box as we move on. So we've had your ideas. But I would say to you, if you're lazy, I'd say to you, if you're shy, if you think other people can do it better, remember that while you're teaching, you're learning. So you giving a workshop will help, uh, will help you to learn as much as other people. So bear that in mind. And now let's think, no more stage fright, but stage right. So there you go. Sound like Andy Scott now. Moving on swiftly to our next section. Uh, yes, it is nerve-wracking. Yes. The first thing that people wrote up there in my stage fright ideas was fear. Um, but the reason to go up is because with fear comes hope. With hope, you have fear. Um, I think the biggest problem with workshops, if you think about it, is that you're doing it without any training, any practice. If you think about a concert pianist or a football player or people who perform on a live stage, singers, etc., they put in hours and hours of practice, repetition, weeks, months, years of practice before they ever get up on stage and do it. And so somebody giving a workshop, you don't do give that workshop 20 times in rehearsals before you actually go and do it. And that's probably where our fear comes from. So certainly it's a challenge for you, and you should be very proud of yourselves for doing it. But that's why I keep going back to teaching, because what happens is giving your first workshop is very much like giving your first class. And did you all survive that? I'd love to be, have the time today to share your, your memories and nostalgia about your first ever classes as a teacher. But I'm sure, uh, I'm sure you all enjoyed it. I'm sure you all survived it. And I'm sure that uh, as also as you teach more and more, you get better and better. And that's the same with workshops too. The first one um, can always be improved. Don't, please don't be a perfectionist. No workshop is perfect. 
I'm hoping today's workshop will go a little bit better than Wednesday's workshop, but Wednesday's workshop went fine enough for me. I'm sure the audience loved it. But you live with that fear. Uh, it's why, one reason why we do it. Every time I go into class, after 15 years of teaching, I still have the butterflies in the stomach. And I hope you do too, because if not, what's the point of doing it? So we need to hit the boards with our fears, with our hopes. Where do we start? Well, there you go. Here are people who've hit the boards for many, many years. You've mentioned some of them already too. Where did they start? What do we do? How do we get a workshop together? Well, of course, we start with an idea. Uh, the big question is, where do you get your idea from? And what do we do with it? And I like, from Business Balls again, this really nice acronym from IDEA, and this is how we're going to be looking at the structure of the workshop today. We need to identify an idea. Paddy's asking, is my idea good enough? A good way of knowing if it's good enough is by asking your, your peers. Yeah? Oh, I've got this idea. The best way of knowing if your idea is good enough, we'll see in a, in a minute, is you've used it in the classroom. Your students have benefited from it. You've got a successful idea in the classroom. That idea is worth sharing with your peers, your colleagues, and people you don't know, other teachers around the world. So we're going to look at how to identify those ideas. Then we're going to look at designing them. Then we're going to look at how to execute them as smoothly as possible. And at the end, we're going to try and augment our ideas. And I'm going to be asking you to augment this workshop. So ideas. Let's identify them. These are places to find ideas, places to get ideas, and places to identify whether or not it's good enough, as Paddy asks us. Starting at the top, we've already talked about your classes. What people most want from a workshop is an idea they can take straight into the class on Monday morning presuming that they're having their workshop today, Friday. So you've got an idea that works in your class. Great. That is the beginning of a workshop. Um, another place to get it is the staff room. Steal your ideas. Borrow your ideas from your fellow teachers. See if they work with your classes, and then you can use it in a workshop, maybe together with the person who gave you the idea. Obviously, credit them. Books and journals are good places to get ideas, to, um, to take but take them into your classroom first. Make sure they work for you before you start sharing them with other people. You can see blogs, web pages. We'll look at these in more ideas. You've done a training course. Maybe other people in your class have in your class, your school haven't done a training course. So share the ideas from the training courses with your fellow teachers. Workshops. You come to live online workshops. Other people in your school don't. Share those ideas. And conferences, same thing. You go to a conference in your local town, other people didn't, share those ideas. You come to one of our online conferences, take those ideas back to your school. It's all about sharing. It's not necessarily about finding something amazingly new and original. We're not looking for whole new approaches to teaching. We leave that to people like Scott Thornbury, and then we can all shoot it down. Kylie suggested another one. Do you have other ideas, other ideas of where to find ideas? The IH Google Group's great for the DOSes ideas to take back to their classes, and particularly the Younger Learners Google Groups, a fantastic place for ideas. So if you have any other ones, click them away there in the, uh, in the chat box there for a second. This is the place. <coughs> to, these are some of the places to find your ideas. Shooting him down, Paddy, shooting him down, not shooting him, don't be silly. Now, before we move on, what I'd like you to, uh, what I'd like to ask you next is, are you thinking of doing a workshop? Um, what ideas do you have for workshops? Uh, because what I'd like to do as I'm talking through the other activities, etc., is try and use examples that relate to some of the workshops that you might be thinking of doing. And at the same time, hopefully, you might meet someone here today who's already done a workshop on the idea. So if you could just type titles of workshops you're hoping to do in the near future or you would like to do. So for example, we've got web resources for teachers using songs. Oh, I've lost my poll. I hope you can still see it. I just clicked in the wrong place. Now I think I've taken it away. There it is. Sorry about that. You see, no workshops perfect. Let's have some more ideas so I can think. 
Oh, drilling, my favourite, which goes very well together with strategies for natural speech. So, you can get together, the two of you, and make a workshop. Supplementary materials. Younger learners, Kylie, everybody wants you to do workshops. Oh, error correction, great. Another one of my favourites. Okay, so, plenty of ideas there. And also, you might think, if I haven't got an idea, you might choose one of these ideas, get together with somebody else. Oh, sorry, have I not put the answers? No. Technology. Here we go. Hopefully you can see them now. Sorry about that, Kylie. If, you're, if you'd really like to find out more about doing one of those workshops, uh, you have ideas, then do ask people in the chat box whether or not uh, uh, who it was who suggested that idea. You can get together, share your ideas together, and do the workshop in two different places using readers in class. I see some of these, for example, um, younger learners, we've had plenty of workshops, guides and methods and approaches, that's one we do from the, on the Delta a lot, speaking with teenagers, using songs, motivating teens, using readers. We've done quite a few online workshops on these uh, areas. Uh, I've certainly presented workshops on these things, so we'll see. This is definitely, hopefully, a platform to, for you to share your ideas. And that's where we're heading next, is what do we do with our original idea? You've got a great song that works in the class. What are you going to do with it? That's not a workshop. We need more ideas. So where do we take them? Sorry, we've discussed our ideas. Moving on. Well, my question is, coming back to these ideas, is you can find other ideas that will go with these, but I also want you to be adding in the chat box other places. So Kylie's mentioned the Google groups, particularly the younger learners ones, doing lows, etc. Um, what what other places can you add ideas to your original idea? So obviously you've got an idea from the classroom. Look for other ideas in your classes. Ask your um, friends in the staff room have they got ideas that would go together with yours, etc. Neil suggesting TED talks. Um, I would, one place I would suggest is, um, as Lisa said at the beginning, I'm doing a Delta course at the moment. We do one once a year. And uh, I think the Delta a, a has a great relationship with workshops. Um, I don't know how many of you have done the Delta, if you'd like to put your hands up, if you have done the Delta. Or are you thinking of doing the Delta, but maybe you're a bit scared about doing the Delta. You've heard about the big D, etc. Whoa, can I do the Delta? Well, it goes both ways. If you've done the Delta, go back to your LSA 2s, your lessons you taught, because your background essays have the ingredients of a workshop. So go back. I love the way that IH Santander, all of us, comes up with a hand. It's like everyone at IH Santander has done the Delta. But you can use your LSAs to create a workshop. And the other way around, if you're thinking, oh, should I do the work? Should I do the Delta? I'm scared of the Delta. Then um, I would say, if you can create a workshop, put a workshop together, then you're ready to do the Delta because you have to basically do the same thing. Study an area, think of some practical ideas, and put it into practice in the classroom. And so if you're thinking of doing the Delta, do yourself a workshop first, and that will get you well underway and on course for it. So that was um, another area where you can think of other ideas, etc. Paddy has suggested other ones as well, the, the magazines and stuff. We have them there, like books, journals is what I was talking about. But teaching uh, journal, the IH journal is all there online for you, completely free. In your school, you might have subscriptions to something like the LTJ, etc. Lovely places to get. Um, other ideas to go with your ideas, because obviously your ideas don't all need to be original, remember? We're into sharing, reminding people about things, and looking at things from a different angle, which is where we're going to go next, because um, some other places, or some examples of those places, for example, I don't know if you all know that on the IH World website, there are a whole load of uh, workshops. They're ready for you to use, ready for you to adapt, maybe, add your idea to. Um, so, for example, somebody put Younger Learners uh, there. There's a Younger Learners workshop here. Uh, it goes much further down, etc., etc. There's workshops for teenagers there um, and things. Someone was talking about approaches and methods. There's approaches to writing there, etc. So, do go there. If you 
don't have access to that, ask your DOS. They will get you access to it. Um, but you can use that workshop as a basis for your workshop. Take some ideas. Lovely resource. Another place to go? Oh, shameless. Oh, sorry, I should have said, by the way, if you just if you click on that photo, this photo, it is a link to the, uh, the website there. So if you want to get in. But obviously, you need to be able to sign in. Um, shameless self-marketing here. This is this is a page from my blog, but you'll see again. I've got a an index of all the presentations and workshops that I've done. So if you want to do something like this again, songs are there, um, error corrections there somewhere, reading is there, etc. Feel free to steal my ideas. You won't have permission because you need to sign in. I uh, Santander, and you might need your DOS to sign in. So you need to talk to the, the DOS. Shameless self-promotion, Lisa. Click on there and you'll go to my blog, but please do. Steal all the ideas, borrow them, ask me questions about them if you want, etc. And we'll talk about blogs and I'll promote some others in a bit. But when you're going to these places, what are you looking for? If you don't know what you're looking for, you're not going to find it. So let's think. What do we need to add to our idea? We need more ideas, which we've already said, and a little bit of theory. I think it's very nice to have a balance in your workshop of theory and practice. They go together very well. So that will add in, and we'll see that more as well in the structure later. But remember, you don't think, oh my god, I need like to read 10 books and have loads and loads of theory correct and everything, and tell everybody everything about everything. I need 20 ideas. No. Remember, the key idea of a workshop is don't overpower people. You don't want too many things. You're looking to empower them. A nice little quote for you there. This workshop, if you think back to the beginning, we had only five stages. I've got five ideas for you. I'm trying to keep them very, very simple. The reason being is because I'm trying to inspire new teachers to do workshops. So there's no whistles and whatever they're called. Uh, it's trying to keep it simple, straightforward. Get up there, share your ideas, and, and give the, a platform for sharing in your school on a particular topic. So remember this. You don't need too many ideas. And look, even Kylie's taken an idea already out of the workshop, so that's great to hear. So a few ideas. Let's add some variety to them. How can we do that? Well, you've, your idea was a song. Uh, it goes great. It's a little. You've got a little thing. It's not just a gap fill. You've got a really nice activity to do with it. But how can we vary it? So different skills. Okay, we listen to songs most of the time. But maybe you can add some other ideas. Ask in your staff room, read a magazine, etc., of how to use reading with uh, songs, or how to get the students speaking about the song, or get them writing about the song, etc. So you can add in other skills to add variety to your ideas, and hence, you've got a workshop about songs. Are you going to steal my photo? Which photo? Uh, language. Your song has some language in it, so find other songs with other language, or can you use the same song with different language? Your activities, that your, your ideas, can you use them with different language? Going on, can you use them with different contexts? Uh, have different ideas, different contexts, you've got yourself a workshop. Think about different learning styles. Can do your ideas uh, help visual learners, kinesthetic learners, etc. So there's a little bit of variety in there. They can be similar ideas, but with these different varieties. And hence, a little bit of changing around, a little bit of variety, and you've got three, four, five thing, three or five for her activities. You've got yourself a workshop. Control by control, I just mean how much control there is over the language that students are using and how much practice. So maybe you've got an idea for practicing in a very controlled manner, or something about drilling, uh, which is extremely controlled. So therefore, think, let's get some other activities that are drilling, but they're not so controlled. So you've got some very controlled, controlled, free, uh, free practice, all to do with different drilling activities, maybe going from substitution drills all the way to class mingles, etc. And then question marks. In the chat box, do you have other ideas of other ways of varying our ideas? so that we keep the main theme, we keep the main thing, but we get a workshop out of two or three ideas. Please do add your ideas to the chat box there. As I think I'm going to take a quick sip of water. Hi. Great. So I'm going to start moving on, but we'll look at your ideas at the same time. Because of what, as well as ideas, we said, we need some theory. And 
we don't need much theory, but it is nice to have some evaluation of your ideas, why your ideas work. Uh, and it's, yeah, exactly as Kylie is saying, it's not just about new stuff, it's also about old stuff, but it's also, I think it is, hopefully it's just you, Paddy, can everybody else hear me okay? Um, what we want, what we need is a few ideas and a few sexy quotes. Yep, it can be old ideas, but evaluating them. Why do they work? Going a little bit deeper, giving a new perspective, a new attitude, new variety. So sexy quotes, where are we going to get our sexy quotes from? Well, we mentioned Scott. We were shooting him down before, so we'll build him back up again now. Uh, if you click on the picture again, you'll get to Scott's blog and to set of ELT. I think it's a particularly good place to be looking for sexy quotes. Not we don't all want to be uh, quoting Scott all the time, but Scott uses lots of sexy quotes. Every week, he gets a new subject, uh, and he discusses it, and he always backs up everything he's saying with lots and lots of sexy quotes. So it's a great place to go, and you'll see, again, here we have an index. So your workshop on um, younger learners, go through, and you won't find younger learners there because it's A and B. Somebody talked about approaches and methods. There's plenty of things there about approach, etc. So you can quote other people, etc. Other blogs are great places for quotes. Obviously, the other things we talked about too, the journals, the IH journals are a great place for a quote. For example, that Paddy talked about. Um, please do add other ideas in the chat box as we go along. Uh, go back to your LSAs on your Delta, the people who've done it. Borrow a, a an LSA off your DOS if you are heading that way. Uh, Twitter is a great place to find quotes, etc. if you've been on Twitter. And talking about that too, other blogs. Uh, I don't know if you know this, click on this page. This is the IH platform. And this page is a list of IH teachers who have blogs. Uh, so not just me there, Sean's blog is there. Uh, anyone here today whose blog is there? Quick looking through you all. I think that if you do have a blog, uh, please do tell me and we'll add it to the list. But this is a great place to come. Uh, click on that. The list will be there. You need to sign in again. Kylie's is there, of course. Sorry, Kylie. Uh, ELT chat is a great place. EFL chat as well. There's two of them. There's lots of different chats. They're great places to find quotes. And also, you'll find summaries of those chats on people's blogs. So if we just click on one of those, for example, when we find Sandy Millen's blog. Sandy is now at IH Newcastle. Okay, so you're not necessarily quoting Sandy, you're quoting the quotes off from her blog, etc. Al's isn't there. That's a very good point, Robin. We need to add Al. Sandy, and also, blogs are a great place to find other blogs. So you see on Sandy's blog, she's got this blog role. And this has got some other great, fantastic blogs. I'm sure Al's is there in that list, Robin. And she has just done a great link about Harry Potter, using Harry Potter in the classroom, Sandy. So that's a place to go to. So blogs, lighter reading than reading a book, a methodology book, but, well, do a bit of both. But it will save you time coming through and looking at, at these, maybe, to find a little bit of theory, a little bit of quote, or even just reading the blogs will help you to develop your own evaluation skills, and then you can quote yourself in your workshops. You see what I mean? But there we go. A little mix. Ideas and evaluation. Ideas and theory. That's basically the idea. So we've identified our ideas. Now it's time to be designing our activities. How are we going to put them together for the workshop? So first of all, we need to order our ideas. And keep it simple. Problem, solution. Give your audience a problem, a teaching problem. What are we going to do in the classroom because of this? And then you, you give them the solution. Your idea is the solution. You're evaluating it. Why is it a good idea, etc. If you have other ways of ordering your workshops, please do add them to the chat box. Another way of looking at it would be theory and practice. And so give them your sexy quotes and then give them some practice. I actually prefer doing it the other way around. Practice, theory, practice. Give them an activity and then discuss the theory behind it, evaluate it together. It's a great process for really getting to understand it. Maybe talk about variations, etc., and then do one of those uh, variations as some more practice. And brilliant. Joanna's come up with exactly what I'm looking for. It's TTT. Test, teach, test. 
Okay, you're testing the audience, see, can they do the activity? Uh, you're teaching them the theory behind the activity and then you're testing them again. And this is the point I'd like to make with the designing, the ordering of the workshop. Is basically, it's the same as planning a lesson. So, in the chat box, what other lesson shapes do you have? Joanna's mentioned TTT. Um, which other ones do you know and love and use? Paul says PPP. Okay, so that would be like maybe presenting the theory and then practicing it, and then you could ask the audience to think of their own activities. That would be a, a PPP style workshop. Uh, the offline, I mean, ARC is okay, authentic, restricted, and and then clarify it. So that would be starting off with an authentic activity you use in the classroom. The restrictedness, not sure. Well, how would you go with that, Paul? What would we do? Restricted the activity. Maybe break it down into its core components or look at the stages of the activity. And then the clarification would be why do each of those stages work? Making that one. TBL, task based learning. Give them a task um, that's coming, kind of coming back to the problem solution. Give them a, a problem to solve themselves and then looking at the solution. Together, they report back on the solutions they gave, which ones they prefer, and then you can go and solve another problem. So you can see that you can use all of these different theories, the, uh, sorry, theories, lesson shapes, in order to shape your workshop. Use them exactly the same. Are MMM? Not sure what MMM is. Are you just humming, or is that a lesson shape? Guided guided is a great one. And you're, you're, going you're going on to think about, about, about to talk about, about it now in a second. second. But certainly you, you can use the same activities if you want to talk about that rather than doing something. Because the talking thing you're doing, 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 one more to one share with you would be getting the audience to brainstorm different ideas, explore those ideas, report back on which ideas they think are the best, and then try and use some of those ideas. Ah, the sound is going. This tends to happen to me for a few seconds during my workshops. Let's pause the video, see if that helps. <clears throat> is that any better now? Is that clearer? Good. Lisa says it's clear now. Okay, I just stopped it. It just tends to happen every day. I don't know if it's a, something to do with Argentina. Uh, sorry about that. So, different lesson shapes. Take them from your classes. Use them in your workshops. Uh, great. So, we've designed a little bit, but also now we need to think, how are we going to execute our workshops? And so now we're coming to the next stage, which is lights, camera, action, putting it into practice. And you've got this great quote from Confucius, which I'm sure you've all seen before, but I think it's a very good idea to get people doing things in your workshop because they like to actually see them into practice, then that really helps them with their own evaluation of the idea. So what different ways can we get people doing things in their workshops? So I'm going to give you some descriptions. Um, and first we'll share a little idea, everybody there, doing things at the DOS conference. I'm going to give you some descriptions of how to do something. And I'd like you to tell me what kind of activity it is. And so the first one is somebody gives a talk to a group of people to teach them about a, a particular subject. In the chat box, what would you call that? Ah, uh, can't be MMM. Um, Indeed, Santander and Paul, it's a lecture. Yep, so that is a possibility. I'm kind of giving you a lecture today, aren't I? We use it quite a lot in the online classroom, trying to keep it as interactive as possible. Don't worry, I've got more polls coming up for you. Um, but it is most of the time the presenter talking. I like to call it a talk more than a lecture. What else have we got for you? The trainer questions the participants, or the participants question the trainer. What would you call that? And it's quite obvious. Yeah, it's a Q&A session, Dan, Lisa. Excellent. Brilliant. Not really a dialogue. It's more of a question and answer. You give them questions, see if they can answer them, come back to them, or vice versa. It's one way of doing a session or maybe a stage in your workshop. Participants work together to pull their ideas on a particular topic. What would you call that? 
Brainstorming. Ah, so you're not very politically correct then where you're coming from because you, apparently uh, it's called a thought shower these days. Brainstorming's not politically correct. So we've changed it to thought showering, which is a fantastic phrase. But yeah, everyone coming together and bringing ideas, uh, which is great. Thought shower does sound sexier indeed, Kylie. What about this one then? The procedural technique used in the input session is a model of the procedural technique which the trainer wishes to transmit. What would you call this? I'm with you too, Dan. We're not very PC in Argentina, but just so you take something away from the session. Loop input. Yep, great. <laughs> Neil, are you thinking wishfully about uh, trying to use the procedures in the input sessions to model them, or are you thinking about the uh, the um, political correctness? Loop input is a great way of, of using input sessions. So you do something about, say, you're talking about listening skills. So give your audience a listening task to do, and the listening task is about listening tasks. But the task they're doing while they're listening to the listening about listening tasks is the task that you're talking about when you're doing the listening task. Are you all confused now? For example, I'm modeling here question and answer. Giving you a question, you're answering question, answer, question, answer. A model of the question answer format. Uh, and so it's a really nice way of getting the teachers to do something, your audience to do something, and at the same time giving them some materials about it. What about the next one? The participants witness a procedure or technique in practice. What would you call this? They're having a think about it. Kylie's come straight in with a demonstration. Yep, this is more showing. And coming back to Confucius, remember, seeing, I remember, but better to be doing. So hopefully try and get as much loop input as possible, but if not, do some demonstration. Oh, the yellow box is already there. What about this one? Give the participants a task, give them the information they need to complete a task, and then they have to work it out for themselves. And by doing this, they come to a greater understanding of what they're doing. So how, what would you call that? Problem solving, guided discovery, great. Yeah, let's call it problem solving. But it is very much a, a guided discovery way. So you can talk about, we need to uh, find a way of improving, again, listening skills, our students' bottom-up listening skills. So they, the students don't understand this when they hear it. So what can we do? Give the teachers uh, what they need in order to construct activities to help with that. And um, we've got another couple, one more. What about this one? You give the participants a task, for example, making a presentation about a, a different language point. They work together in groups. They bring their resources, their knowledge, experience together. They complete the task together. Uh, and then they would present their ideas to everybody. And you are there to help them as a consultant, etc. It is very tbl -y. Uh They're doing it as a challenge, if you like. You can make it competitive. But we're actually going to call that, that is actually a workshop. Uh, so that means that today isn't a workshop, really, because I'm not really giving you tasks. I'm pulling you together because of the online environment. So, but a workshop is that actually getting the audience to work during the workshop. I think I've got one more for you. No, a couple more. This is a, maybe a new one for some of you to take away. Maybe just put a poster on the wall with some related information to the workshop. It could be an article. It could be a procedure. It could be other ideas, etc. But you, it's, you don't draw the participants' attention to it. You just leave it there. If they see it, they can read it, maybe in the break, maybe before the session, after the session. Subliminal advertising. Exactly, Kylie, yes. Uh, yep, put up all your blog pages, etc., pictures of your babies on the walls, etc., and get into do it. No, this is called peripheral input. Exactly, Kylie. Peripheral input, giving them the choice to go a little further, etc. So it's a really nice thing to do, particularly with sort of further articles, etc. You think, oh, this is extra great ideas, but I haven't got time for it. <laughs> I'm not sure about brainwashing, Lisa. Uh, but peripheral is not that, because you're not. It's all about the uh, audience having the choice whether or not they want to get there. Thought washing, I like that. And finally, classic activity: two versions of a text. 
again, this will be very loop inputy as well. You, you give them things that you're talking about. Uh, one text about listening skills, another text about listening skills. They read their text and then they talk to their colleague about it uh, and get ideas out of each other's texts. And through that process, they are doing. And that's Santander, yep, and all those massively Delta qualified teachers in Santander have come up with the, the jigsaw reading, which, oh, yes, it is an information gap. Um, but the classic jigsaw reading. So we've got nine suggestions for you there. Um, oh, Santander are dancing up and down. Is that a qu if you've got a question, please do ask it in the chat box. Nine suggestions there for you for, about how to design the activities you might use in your workshop, or some of these could be whole workshops. So we've got orders, we've got activities. Uh, and now, I think we're probably ready to execute our workshop. We need to think about how to bridge the gap between us as the presenter and our audience, because I think it's very important that you enjoy your workshops too. So let's have a little look about how we could make them a little bit more fun. Remember, if you don't have fun, you haven't got a show. Um, I can say thank you to you all already, because I'm really enjoying uh, the workshop and all your fantastic contributions in the chat box. So how can we bridge the gap? And well, it's time to talk about Jeremy again. Here's Jeremy giving a, a plenary session at the our last IH uh, talk, our last online conference. And what can you see in the picture in the middle of Jeremy's talk, which is actually, oh, Paddy, I love it, the plenary session. Yep, that's actually one of our other ideas, OK? Um, this picture doesn't actually come from his talk at the workshop. This comes from a, a talk he did here in Buenos Aires, a live talk. Uh, and basically, it's a glider. And his whole session was threaded together through a story he told. And this is the idea that I'm getting to. It's telling a story. Uh, it, it was all about him getting up in a glider, experiencing the glider, etc. And therefore, he made a whole um, workshop out of that about basically teachers getting feedback from each other and sharing with each other. And of course, I think hopefully you'll all agree that Jeremy is a great speaker. Um, but I do have one slight criticism of Jeremy, and I did tell him, him to this after the workshop, that he only tends to have one idea in his workshops. But this is great for us, because you're thinking, oh, I'm too scared to do a workshop. I've only got one idea. Well, it's great. So, such a fantastic speaker as Jeremy, Jeremy, who is almost as good as our own Andy Scott, who we'll talk about later has one idea. And out of that idea, he tells a story and brings it all together. OK? For example, for this workshop, I could have told you a story right at the beginning about my first workshop went absolutely fantastically all those 15 years ago in Pilsen in the Czech Republic. It was at a, I think it was an ITEFL Czech Republic uh, conference. And I think it was about telling jokes. And everybody had a lovely time. They were, there was about 200 people there. They all found all my jokes hilarious, etc. And then three weeks, very good brewery, Lisa, yeah. Three weeks later, I did the same workshop in, um, back in Prague at a teacher center. There were six people there. None of them had a sense of humor. They didn't laugh at any of the jokes. They didn't like any of the activities. And it was uh, probably my least favorite experience as a workshop. But I also, at the same time, got a lot out of it. And what happened? How did I get back onto the stage again? Well. There, I could have taken you through the workshop um, by telling the story of how I got back up on stage. So that would have been the story of this workshop. Alternatively, and the things I prefer myself, and here I am giving one of my uh, workshops, and in my workshops I like to include a metaphor, Okay, using a metaphor. What's the metaphor for today's workshop, everybody? Stop thinking about breweries and type away in the chat box. Dip down there straight away. Acting the theatre, taking the stage, okay, getting up on the stage, as in becoming a workshop presenter, etc. It's kind of a, a workshop. A workshop. It's kind of a metaphor, but at the same time, it's kind of literal as well, because obviously you do have to. Uh, do I find it hard to use humour online, Neil? <laughs> um, I think you've just got to use it anyway, Kylie, and hope in the chat box you pick up on the the, the onda, the ambience, etc., and whether people are laughing. People can even laugh. There is a smiley. They don't tend to. Look, there I am laughing for you. Um, anyway, back to my metaphor. 
uh, I could actually give you a different metaphor. Here's my metaphor for this workshop. Uh, uh, what can you see here in front of you? There's a lovely Argentine barbecue. So I hope you're all getting hungry now. It's lunchtime for a lot of you over there in Europe. It's an asado, Georgina. Yay. And so we can think that it's very difficult for me to do an Argentine asado for lots of Argentines. Obviously, the pressure is on. They're much more experienced than me, etc. Very, very similar to doing a workshop for very experienced teachers. Obviously, you've got to get your idea. What's my idea? A big fat steak. But you've got to prune it down a bit, cut off the fat, etc. You need to get some other uh, activities or other types of meat to have variety. And then you've got to order it all together uh, to make sure you get the timing right. Very important, the timing when you're cooking it. Don't cook it right through, Paul. It's got to be, got to be a bit broad. So therefore, that's my metaphor of uh, creating a workshop is cooking a barbecue. And at the end of the workshop, you get, uh, you win the lady. Uh, so you're very successful. Or the silly hat, whichever way you like it. But there's my first Argentine barbecue successfully finished. Uh, yeah, okay, so actually the truth is I had to feed it all to the dog because I burnt it. But don't worry. What else can we do to bridge the gap between us and the audience? Well, here's Andy. Oh, hello, Kylie. Hello, Lisa. Andy doing his workshop at the conference. One of his great strengths in his workshops is telling jokes, keeping the humor there. Kylie's just been asking about it. But it's a really nice way to get everybody together. Yeah, it can be more difficult online because you can't necessarily see everyone. I think you just have to presume they're laughing along with you. And if they're not, it doesn't matter. Uh, he's mentioning Germany too. And the, f the final, and I think the most important one, and here is Lisa doing it because she's extremely brilliant at doing this. Uh, you can tell stories. You can have metaphors. You can tell jokes. But you might think, oh, I can't go up on stage because I can't do any of these things. It doesn't matter. The most important thing is, oh, sorry, I've got another invasion there. Ah, be yourself. Most important. Uh, OK. Doesn't matter if you're not a comedian. Doesn't matter if you can't think of a metaphor. The most important thing is be yourself. Share experiences from your classroom. Tell, the, tell them about your students and, and why they enjoyed an activity or you had a problem and therefore you solved it. Can they help you, etc. Most important is just to be yourself, particularly if you're scared of doing a workshop in front of your peers uh, because they know who you are. And so don't try, you don't have to try and be someone else. You don't have to try and be Jeremy or Andy Scott. So uh, be yourself and you'll have a successful workshop. So that's how to execute the workshop. Uh, and here we are finishing off our idea the final thing we need to do is augment it. Uh, so it's really time to hand over to you. There you are in the audience. Hope not even laugh. Look, you're all asleep at the DOS conference. And it's time to hand it over to you. And I'm going to ask you to reflect and to give me some feedback to augment my workshop for me for the future. And how can we do that? Well, we can get people to reflect. And I think it's very good to leave them some space at the end of a workshop to reflect. I didn't manage to do it on Wednesday, but I've managed to do it today. You see, a little bit of experience does help doing something more than once. Kylie's gone mad. Oh, that's her, her Kylie signature. So I'm going to ask you to reflect in a moment, but what else am I going to ask you to do? Questions and answers. If you do have any other questions, then please do ask them as we come to the close of the workshop. And then you can also get your audience to do a survey. Of course, I'm going to, I've got a survey for you. Uh, survey Monkey is great because you can give a link. Face-to-face -face workshop, online workshop, doesn't matter. Give them a survey. They will give you feedback. What are the things they liked about the workshop and not? So I shall give you that in a moment. But first of all, the reflection. I've got three questions for you, and I'm going to put them, I have them in polls. So I'm going to ask you, first of all, remember, going right back to the beginning, we were talking about stage fright. And I'd like you to tell me, do you think we've dissipated the stage fright? Are you ready? now to get up on stage and take the stage? No, not at all. Or no, not quite what about. If it's what about, I'd like you to write your what abouts in the chat box. What bits haven't we quite addressed? You're, you still have doubts about, because uh, they're the bits I'd like to know so that we can maybe discuss them quickly now. And I can try and cover them again if I do this workshop. What things are you still a little bit worried about? It's great to see such a big number of yes, hopefully you're all inspired now to do a workshop. 
any ideas as you're writing down the things you would also you'd, you're still worried about I have another question for you which is do you have any other ideas and recommendations at the beginning you showed you've got quite a lot of experience as an audience giving workshops so do you have any other ideas and recommendations you'd like to share with those of us that are less experienced so let's have a look at the what's coming through. Lisa was more terrified than usual before her first time. It's not about being afraid of about taking the plunge. I think that very much goes to the back to the fear and hope quote, Lisa. What's your about, Kylie? I make it look so easy. You get verbal diarrhea and lose track of yourself. The tips. Well, I think the tips are, are to be pla to plan your workshop well, Kylie. Um, I'm actually feeling like I have verbal diarrhea. I, I'm talking very quickly, saying a lot. Um, Etc. Oh, sorry, I'm just trying to get through the chat box. You're obviously going to make mistakes, etc. Kylie, it doesn't matter as I am doing now. Um, experience helps. Obviously, the second time you do it, it will come even more. And there's some ideas here that getting a guinea pig to listen to it, planning what you're saying. It's the same in the classroom. Do you talk too much in the classroom? Write your instructions, script it. Here online, you can have your screen and your notes next to it so you can keep to those notes. I personally don't like to, but. Uh, some people do. Paul, you're posting surveys like the question box. Easy to do. It's very easy to do, Paul. Um, and certainly, if you are interested in doing a live online workshop, anybody, we will prepare you and give you all the uh, the technical things that you need beforehand. We will give you a dress rehearsal, as Lisa is suggesting there. Here, if you want to do a live online workshop, you can record yourself doing it to, for yourself without any audience, and then come back, look at it, and try and do it. How does the plan B work, Victoria? Well, it doesn't really, because I doubt Lisa would actually want to do the workshop. We'd, if, the, if I was to lose my internet, we would have to postpone it, because uh, there's not much you can do. But hopefully these days, the internet, etc., works very well. But there's always strange. Face-to-face -face as well, yeah, you need your backup plans, etc. But life does happen, and life does even affect workshops. Um, so we're there. Robin's got a great piece of advice there. Do something you feel passionate about because that's really going to get you energized uh, and enthused and hopefully enthuse your audience. I'm very passionate about trying to help people do workshops. Okay. Yeah, I'm sure Lisa could fill in for the, the whole of the workshops. She could probably go through the slides. It did happen to me once at a DOS conference. I was doing a half hour session and they had no internet. And so Sean had my slides and Sean had to talk everybody through my slides for half an hour. So that was our backup plan. Not the best, but there you go. So ideas and recommendations, great stuff. Thank you very much for sharing these. Less is definitely more. Remember, we've been talking here together for an hour, and I've got five main points or ideas. Uh, none of them new, I don't think, but hopefully all of you will be taking home something, a different angle on something, remembering something, and you've had the chances to share things as well. Uh, and so definitely get someone else to present your presentation beforehand. Ah, that's a great way of seeing whether or not it's going to be very clear, your instructions, how to set up the activities, etc. if you can do. That is slightly time consuming, but if you're going to do the workshop two or three times, then it can definitely help. Um, definitely plan in different stages. Yep, sharing questions, reflection stage. Hope we've had all of those in today's workshop. Have something to do with your hands, wave them about online. Um, the sweaty palms, yep, yeah, that's hopefully, to be honest, the sweaty palms happen before the workshop. Once you get going, once you get into your flow, it's just like a lesson. Hopefully, like me, you still get butterflies before every single class, but maybe only like 10 seconds now rather than two days. Uh, and so enjoy that feeling. It's the adrenaline rush. That's all part of reasons for doing it. Do it locally before doing it online or in a conference. Yeah, the first time you do a workshop, try and find as, as supportive and positive an audience as possible. Uh, some, some, of you, some of you, that will be your peers. For some of you, that will be complete strangers. It depends, but choose, the, or choose your audience, particularly the first time. Get some nice pic pictures. Uh, always have a great message. I chose to use quotes today next to my sexy quotes, quote city. Im, uh, images are very powerful, particularly if you're doing a PowerPoint presentation, either face-to-face -face or online. Certainly go through it by yourself very quickly. 
Definitely, definitely, definitely rehearsal. There you go. Everyone's talking about practice first. And I think this is the key aspect of workshops that's missing from other things, as I said earlier, about concert pianists, footballers, etc. So great. One last question for you. If I just click on the button. Was there anything else that you thought I was going to talk about or address here and I haven't had time to or I didn't think about? Anything else you would like to talk about that we'll add them to next time? Great. Thanks very much for coming, Beverly, everybody, and great for sharing your ideas with everybody. I will leave that there. Definitely. But getting people to participate in your workshop is great. It's not about the new ideas. It's about providing the platform for everybody to share. So that's our reflection. It seems like no one else had anything else to talk about, so that would be great if we've covered everything. So I'll get rid of that before anyone types anything in it. And I presume then, therefore, any questions and answers, put them in the chat box or email them to me. It is now 11 o'clock, so it's about time to finish. And finally, the survey. There is the survey. Uh, this is my feedback survey. It'd be great if you could just spend a few minutes. There it is. I'm going to open it for you, hopefully on your computers. Wow, the technology. Has that opened for you? And you can click it yourselves if it hasn't. Please do give me a little bit of feedback, what you liked, what you would like to add to it for next time. Uh, remember, the videos of the recordings will be available very, very quickly. Wow, Flavia, that's good, isn't it? Uh, that's all part. That takes two seconds. There it is. Um, I wasn't so bad at self-marketing that I opened a link to my blog for you. But I have another couple of things to share with you. Please do, do do the survey. You can't sign up for Paddy's yet, Kylie, because Paddy hasn't signed up to do it, but I'm sure he will. Here are the useful websites that I use. They're on the slides. The slides will be available for you. You can click on those links if you want any of them. Mind Tools has the basic steps of a workshop. Doug Johnson has uh, 10 very good tips about a workshop. Uh, things to do to make a successful workshop. Business Balls is where I got those posters from, but there's a lot of other fantastic ideas on there about um, management, presentations, etc. It's a great place if you're a business English learner. And finally, Wikipedia has a whole list of places to get pictures. Somebody just mentioned images. Great, Paddy, to see you there. Thank you all very much. And just one last quote for you. Remember, it's only as we develop others that we permanently succeed. Interesting quote for you there. And that's a great reason to be doing a workshop. So hopefully you're all now inspired. You will now take the stage yourselves. Thank you all very much for coming today. I've really enjoyed myself and had a lot of fun. I hope you have too. I hope that you've got at least one new thing out of today's workshop. I hope you've remembered something maybe that uh, you can take into your next workshop. And I hope you've had the opportunity to share an idea. And it's been great sharing my ideas with you all today. So thank you all very much for coming. A couple of adverts for you I've mentioned. Andy Scott, who you saw earlier, uh, tells great jokes, loves his songs and actions. He's going to be talking about FCE, the musical, in February. So please do come along for that. I shall now open the page to the, uh, the IH Lowe's. should be opening for you. Uh, that's where all the information is. At the moment, the information is for my workshop. But Andy's information will be up there soon. I'm hoping we might try and get him to do it on Wednesday and Friday as well, but that depends. We haven't quite finalized his times and dates yet because he is actually in Australia. But Andy's going to be talking about FC the Musical in two or three weeks. Great, Robin. I'm looking forward to your workshop. I hope you can come and do it online for us later in the year. And there, there is the page again, just in case it didn't open for you. And then... If you're thinking, oh, I would like to take the stage, but wow, a whole workshop's too much for me, then we have a great uh, opportunity for you at our next conference, the IH Talk 60, where we'll be celebrating together 60 years of International House for you to take the stage for the first time. Because we're, the idea of celebrating the 60 years is to get 60 people talking. And so we're going to have 60 10-minute talks over two days. And so... It's a great opportunity for you to take your first steps into online workshops because you only have to talk for 10 minutes. You'll only need one idea, a couple of slides, a little bit of talking, and even you can get people participating, etc. So if I eat Santander, count as six people. So you can do, you could have the I eat Santander hour. Uh, we're going to have themed hours. 
Um, but it would be great if as many of you as possible could come and take the stage at the conference. There's the call for papers. You can click on the link there, or I shall just open it for you too, because I love doing that. So sorry for controlling you so much. But obviously you don't have to fill that in now, but do think about it. Take one idea. It could just be uh, something successful happens in the classroom, um, a new way of practicing language, uh, a great speaking task that you use in TBL, etc. A fantastic game to play with your younger learners. Any kind of idea, but you've got 10 minutes to talk about it, uh, introduce it to everybody, do it with the audience, etc. And we're going to theme the hours by different themes, younger learners, classroom management, technology, etc. But we do need to find 60 people, so please, some of you, come and take the stage with us, hopefully on the back of today's session. So there you go. That's all for me. Thank you all very much for coming. Have a great day, great weekend, etc. Do get in touch if you have any questions or ideas. Uh, there's my email address. And woof, that's it for today. So thank you all very much. Thank you very much to Lisa for being a fantastic moderator. And hope to see you all at Andy's workshops in a, two or three weeks' time. Take care, everybody. Thanks and I'm going to rest you. my voice. An excellent session there, and I'm sure we're going to have loads of people signing up for the next conference, the 10 minutes, and also for Andy's, which I can't wait for. And I think everyone would like to join Alexandra and Neil in giving Neil a, uh, a huge round of applause there. So thank you very much. Oh, can't really hear me. I can hear you fine, actually, Lisa. Oh, okay. It's just Kylie. You're not speaking Well, loud. it might not just be Kylie. But... Okay. Um, I, I'm not sure if, Tanya, have you raised your hand or you were meant to clap there?